Welcome back, Day Camp friends, to the Day Camp Podcast. I am Andy Pritikin, the director of Liberty Lake in the Philly Burbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Crystal Lake, Illinois. And I'm Aaron Gluckstein from Camp Robin Hood, located just outside of Toronto in Canada. Yeah, we are day camp professionals joining forces to provide a forum for summer camp pros like you to share ideas and best practices across North America and beyond. And for today's podcast, we are joined once again by our friend Michael Brandwine to discuss the relationship between specialists and other day camp staff. Oh my goodness, I am so excited. Could there really be a more day camp centric topic than something like this, right? Well, for those of you that don't know Michael, um, he has spoken and continues to speak at the biggest day camp uh, and camp conferences across the country and the world. He has spoken in all 50 states in America. Um, he was a lawyer at one time, which everybody loves hearing. Um, and, you know, we were joking around uh, before we got on about Second City. He actually went to theater school there, too, so, um, which definitely comes through in your work still, Michael. Um, he continues to, uh, to consult and speak for all kinds of organizations all, all, all around the world. Michael, what's the weirdest one you've done lately that would be not camp centric? And not a podcast? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, oh, I've done a few uh, national youth organizations, including Campfire, uh, uh -huh. which uh, uh, does wonderful work. Uh, in youth development, a very innovative work. That was uh, that was uh, really fun. But uh, um, let's see, mechanical engineers. Uh, I uh, have my foot, uh, I have my foot in uh, both the uh, education area, but I also like working for uh, the corporate and Fortune 500 types because uh, they're just campers that uh, have grown up and now get uh, W4 forms. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So. Uh, uh, you know, we have all these ideas of all these topics. Um, but when I talk to Michael, um, he'll he'll come up with anything. Um, he's great like that. But at the same time, I like to know like what he's excited about. And when somebody says, man, I am really excited to talk about specialists and their relationship, right. you know, to camp. And I was just like, wow, what an awesome niche that we all struggle with. I hire teachers all the time to run activities. And, you know, these, these folks, they come in with a big head of steam and they think they know what they're doing because they've been doing it for a long time in a school setting, but then they come to camp and it is very much different. And, uh, you know, the, the big thing that I try to get them to understand is to utilize the counselors, right? And I tell them that, you know, uh, over the course of an eight week summer season, that if they try to do everything themselves, that they will number one, lose their voice, number two, lose their patience, and number three, maybe not even make it through the summer. <laughs> of course. So how it's imperative to do that. But for so many of them, it's just something they don't do, right? Unless you're a classroom teacher that has like assistant teachers or inclusion teachers or something in your room, these folks live very authoritative work lives, right? You walk into their kingdom and they're the king and that's it, right? And at a day camp, you, you know, that only goes so far, right, Michael? Yes, no, that's absolutely right. And um, one of the first questions we can ask people who lead activities uh, is, how will you make this different than it would be at school? That's mm. immediately followed by another question, which is, this in no way implies that there's anything wrong with the way we do it at school, but it is important to take advantage of a camp setting and the kind of experiential learning and discovery opportunities that we have at camp. And it's a great question. In fact, when walking around from activity area uh, uh, from one to the other, that's one of my favorite questions to ask the people who are in the activities. So if they're doing art or they're doing drama or they're doing sports, one of the uh, questions that's great to ask them is, so what can we do to take more advantage of this as a camp? Because they may have just finished teaching in school, some of them, not all. And uh, that may be the mode that their uh, their brain is in. So, yeah, and, and most of them don't even have that mode, right? Because especially the longer they've been institutionalized at a school, the less they even have that like that creative thing going. Um, I wouldn't and, change that phrase, institutionalized, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word I use. But yeah, it, it is. I know what you mean. The... Um, you know, Michael's got some great books. Um, I'll plug one right away. I think it was the training terrific staff where you, you use the metaphor, the whole thing about the soccer, the, the different ways yes, to play soccer. Right. right. I, I love that. I, I use that all the time. You know, why not set up so for soccer goals? 
you know, on, on different ends of things. So right. like, like, you know, how to come up with creative things. And we do this during our specialist orientation because, you know, I'm joking around about the institutionalized thing, but frankly, a lot of these people have never really tried to get super creative, you know, in the school setting because they're trying to teach the curriculum and they're trying to just get it done. Right. And, and now we're coming to a place where, where we're trying to, in a way, edutain them, right. We're trying to teach them stuff in a fun setting. Right. And by just running drills, and that's another great Michael Brandwine thing from his book, right. Who the hell wants to use drills with children? Like just sounds like you're the dentist. It's not, it's not a positive word, right. Lead up games. Right. He recommends. Um, Yeah. You know, getting those people into that kind of mode is a challenge. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. Absolutely. And in fact, I, Sam and Aaron, do you do any kind do you have a specialist training or some introduction to these subjects for the people who are, uh, uh, who are your activity leaders? I don't have um, specific activity specialists. I do have a lot of inclusion aids. Um, and during the interview process, everybody gets the same questions. Um, and they're paired with a counselor, so it's a partnership. So it's the Aaron uh, Andy group. And one of them is, has in the back of their mind that they're the eyes on so-and-so, but yet they're working with the whole group too. Right, yeah. Well, all of the techniques that we will and should talk about in this podcast for those of you uh, joining us are uh, fully applicable to Sam's situation. Um, yeah. We'll be using activities as the example of how to prepare activity leaders to work with others and increase collaboration. But we need to increase this kind of collaboration with people who are assigned to individual campers because of their special needs or challenges too. And I'll just, I'll yeah, just jump Karen, in uh, quickly. Just yeah, for us, what we've what we've done is, I mean, we've tried a few different things over the years, and our process uh, has evolved a little bit. But um, we have a, a separate group of people that are that are dedicated specialists, and they um, they do some training, and they're they're part of a a, a cohort to get that uh, works together throughout the the summer. Um, and what we've tried uh, in recent years is having them um, cover a, a several different specialty areas, so that they're not um, I guess like, you know, segregated to, with quotes, um, to, you know, to one split place the whole summer, but they get a chance to work with a, a, you know, a variety of different, uh, um, other specialists, but there still is a, a divide that, uh, you know, that we're always looking for, for ways to, to, you know, kind of break and, uh, and, um, you know, m- um, remedy. Well, Andy, it might be good if we just did a quick vocabulary run for 30 seconds here, because I hope some of the people listening are new to day camps as well as veterans like the, uh, the folks I'm sharing the microphone with here, um, uh, Sam, Aaron, and Andy. Um, we're using the term specialist here to talk about people who are hired um, primarily to teach one particular activity. Aaron's touched on a really great secret. Sometimes you can have somebody work in sports but then in perhaps another area or several different sports so that they don't get tired teaching the same thing all summer. But basically, let's use the term, if it's okay, activity leader to mean uh, these people who are specialists in uh, instruction on this particular part of the day camp schedule. Examples might be uh, music or drama uh, or given given the the current focus of day camps on uh, really hot topics, things like teleportation or whatever it is, psychokinesis, whatever we're teaching the kids in the, in the upcoming summer. I'm, Andy, or I'm yoga. Right. Yeah, right, yes, right, right. Ice cold yoga, uh, hot yoga, all the yoga. Goat, goat yoga at Liberty Lake. Goat yoga? Do oh, you- yeah. You put the little pygmy goats on the on the backs of the children while they're in the uh, oh, upward excellent. dogs. Excellent. I'm Wonderful. Very therapeutic. Yes, that sounds good. So um, uh, I know when I was a day camp counselor, I would bring my kids to that, uh, we would call activity area or specialist area. And it was my job then to assist uh, the uh, activity leader in teaching that. And so we can use group leader to mean the person who's escorting the kids to that particular activity. In other camps, you know, these would be the group counselors or these would be the staff, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, there are different ways to run day camps, but 
I'll, we'll just use that as a basic model. If your model is different than this, you can still use these kinds of principles. The, the, the first thing that I tell people is that before you even open your mouth and talk to the activity leaders or the staff about how they should collaborate and come together, um, first talk to yourself. Don't say a word to anybody else. Talk to yourself and ask, what is the relationship that I want to have between these two groups of uh, employees and or volunteers. Um, the hypothetical in, in workshops that I, I pose to directors is, suppose you have a highly qualified instructor who's been teaching this for 15, 20, 30 years, and she or he says to you, I really don't need any help doing this. Um, uh, if there are staff there, it'd be great if they can take the kids to the bathroom when they need to go. If one of them has a fit, uh, they throw a tantrum. I don't want to deal with that. I want the staff person. And then they will add in parentheses, but underlined, um, because of course they know the kids in their group best, quote unquote. Um, but basically I want to teach tennis and I'm here to teach archery and I'm here, I'm here, et cetera. You sound like you've been doing this for a while, Michael. Yeah, That's, just for a while. It, um, my uh, goodness. I, that was, that right. was so yeah. verbatimly insane. Perfect. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I've heard this a lot. And so I think the right starting point, I, you know, I throw it open to my three friends here. But to me, the starting point is decide just on your own, sit with your favorite beverage and say, how do I feel about that? Um, I know how I feel about it. Uh, and uh, uh, since I've got the microphone, you can't stop me. I'll tell you how I feel about that attitude. The first thing is, um, I, uh, I think this is a great example of uh, the mission of camp. We are not only trying to develop our campers, but we're also developing our staff. And this is a difficult uh, 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 thing to understand because it's an extra burden, but our uh, customers, as it were, our, uh, our product involves not only the young children, but also our staff. This is an incredible opportunity to develop young people. And so I want them to learn how to teach. I want them to learn how to be great instructors. And here you've got this uh, veteran teacher, even if it's just somebody who played varsity, you know, football or soccer or, uh, freshman year in university. These are really skilled people. These are athletes. These are great artists. They may not be, you know, 19 or 20 years old, but they have a lot to share. And I want them to share what they know about teaching, not necessarily that subject, but just teaching anything and communicating, developing a good relationship between coach uh, or teacher and student. And I, I, it's, that's why it's not okay for them to just say, oh, I can teach X subject all by myself, because then it doesn't develop our staff. And we want to make that part of the mission of camp. We make a huge difference in multiple countries around the globe by developing staff as great young adults and future parents and future teachers and such. So that's and, one. Andy, and and it, yeah, and, and I would say, I'm going to just jump on a number two which is that part of our mission also is to teach kids and our staff these 21st century skills, right? right. Which, which they, they're having a hard time learning on their own and at home and in the classroom and whatever. And the big one to me in this relationship between counselors and activity leaders is collaboration, right? And, and, and you know, what a perfect Petri dish this is for that. Right. For that really to take place, the give and the take to know, you know, how to be respectful. You know, part, one of my pet peeves as an adult working with other adults is people saying, I don't I, I don't want to step on their toes. So I'm not going to say anything kind of attitude. Right. right. That passive aggressive kind of thing that happens constantly in our lives. Right. And, you know, meanwhile, loud people like myself, like Michael, we'd have no problem with doing it. But um, for most people, they, they, they get very worried about that kind of thing. And this kind of, uh, you know, environment. It, it 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 can create an out and and it could create a great learning situation for these people to get better at it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You also have to worry about the counselors feeling like, oh, I'm dropping the kids off. I'm going to sit here and do whatever, and not listen while this other person takes it. And um, I, you know, I, you go on field trips, and the people will say, "Oh, I love your group because they're involved." And I think, what are these other counselors doing? Thinking, yeah, they're oh, chaperoning. That's it. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. The yeah. second big thing uh, to uh, emphasize is that uh, to deliver outstanding instruction and to meet the mission with our kids, 
we can't just do it with the head instructors. Uh, we need a, a better ratio. We need more adults with the kids. And we really need those uh, group counselors uh, the, uh, to uh, be in there with the kids as part of this process. So in other, a simpler way to say that, I suppose, is uh, the activity leader by herself can't provide that kind of one-on-one -on -one uh, development of our young people. One of the great advantages of camp, if you just put it on a small card, would certainly be the small group size. It's, it, it, it beats school easily because we can work with groups of two or three campers at a time at camp, which is, of course, uh, uh, something likely to, to be seen at public or private school. Right. So, but but yeah, just as a, a follow-up on that, in a group of children that is coming to an activity, there is a wide continuum of talent there right of experience whether it's basketball or art or music or whatever it is you're going to have kids that are beginners you're going to have kids that are super experienced that are taking lessons at home right and everything in between and now here's this group of whether it's 10 or 20 kids or whatever it is and you can't expect good service talking about the, the outstanding uh, quality uh, that we're trying to achieve you can't achieve that by just teaching to the middle and giving them just this general thing. And if you have these other staff there to augment you, then you can have them help out the kid that right. is a beginner. Help give some extra to the kid that already knows how to dribble basketball, right? And that kind of thing too. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, so I would say that's point number one. First, have a vivid vision of what this collaborative relationship is going to be because everyone is going to pick up what your expectations are. And to execute on those expectations, we have to decide, are they narrow, which they are at, at, at some camps, or are they uh, deeper, as we've just described for those two reasons. The next big secret that I love to talk to directors about is that, um, in my experience, the usual approach here is to talk to the staff about what their role is and to emphasize for them that they have to step up and be active assistants. I actually think that's a missed opportunity and I wouldn't start there at all. When I've overheard these or participated in them myself back in the days of dinosaurs, I would, uh, uh, I'd hear lectures, you know, you, this is not a time just for you to sit or to chat with your colleagues. You're very important, blah, 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 blah. And so in training, what we do is talk to the staff about what they're supposed to do. I would like to flip that and strongly recommend that the, the most uh, 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 positive thing you can do is to run a 15 minute minimum, maybe 20 max session for your activity leaders and get them to be more expert at involving the staff, uh, the group counselors. That's a piece of training that I think many camps uh, miss uh, the importance of. And it's, it's very, very uh, um, uh, uh, essential that the uh, activity leaders know how to get these people more actively involved. And so then the next question I always get is, well, what would be the curriculum of that? What would be the content of yeah, that? Yeah, what does it look like? Well, yeah, so um, I think there's two or three major components. Is it all right if I just- um, uh, Please, go uh, for it. Okay, so the first component is I ask them two or three questions, and by them, I mean the activity leaders. And the first question I always ask them is, what do you want the relationship to be? between you and these folks who are bringing their kids. One very good training method, um, and it's very efficient, is just stand there with your flip chart and just say, give me some words. Uh, my preference is to use uh, the technique in my books I call WIBIT, W-I-B-Y-T, which is write it before you talk. I actually uh, give them a blank sheet of paper and I give them 60 seconds and I say, write down the words that describe the relationship that you want. This way, 100% of the people are involved. And then after a minute, I say to them, so would you share some of those words? And we write them down. To cut through this, the word that I'm looking to lead them to is the P word it's partner. I want them to view these people not as assistants. Assistance, I think, is the wrong word. It's going to get you in trouble. I never use that word myself. We talk about the difference between an assistant and a partner. Now, I want to prepare you for this because some of them, either through eye rolls while you're using this word, or um, uh, you know, maybe they'll raise their hand and they'll actually say it, but they'll say, well, but then who's in charge here? You have to have an immediate answer to this. What I tell them is you are an ultimate 
control and you are ultimately responsible for tennis, for crafts, for drama, for music. You are, and then I smile at them and say, you're the head partner. Yeah. You're the head uh, partner. Are you, are you, the metaphor I use similar yes. is, is I say you're the head coach, right? Imagine you're a college football okay. player, right? Yes. And then you have the head coach and then you got all these assistant coaches, right? What does a head coach do during the uh, practice? They walk around and make sure all the assistant coaches are teaching it the exactly. right way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great one. The reason, of course, I don't use that is because of my uh, extraordinary sports background <laughs> and, and my knowledge. Why are you laughing? And, and my knowledge that uh, if I use sports with the drama or the arts person, that they may actually, you know, they may have never played sports and they may not know that relationship. But partners, I think, is a word that uh, I found to be universally applicable. I, um, I think coach is a great subset of that and a great example that many of them will understand, Andy. I, I, I completely agree. Um, uh, if you're the head partner, what you want to do then is uh, you want to um, uh, have that kind of relationship. So the goal in the first three minutes of this quick training or conversation, discussion with your activity leaders is that's the relationship that we want to have. And that's what we're going to tell them during training is the relationship we want them to have with you. The second thing I do is I go to the flip chart and I say, what messages do you want to send to these people who are your partners? And what messages do you not want to send? This also is a great two minute activity. So, um, and I'll just cut through this. The messages you don't want to send are, I'm the boss, I'm the expert here, um, uh, I'm your parent, uh, I don't need you, I can do this by myself, but my boss told me because he listened to some cockamamie podcast that I'm supposed <laughs> to grow you on top of growing the kids and you know, three dollars an hour here. So if that's what she says I have to do, that's what I'm going to do, but look at my face, I don't like it. Um, uh, they actually have fun with the negative messages because adults love to be destructive. And I put those on two different sheets of paper and I tell them, look, it, communication is all about sending messages. When we have great clarity about what we want to communicate and what we don't, um, this is very helpful. I wrap this up by saying, how do we communicate messages? We do that not only verbally but and through lecture, but we do it, of course, non-verbally in the way we structure our relationship. So, for example, I communicate with my beautiful wife, Donna, in many different ways. I may not say things to her. I should, but yeah, I, it may not be something I say to her. The way I treat her, the way I treat our relationship sends messages about what I believe is, is about our equal partnership. So uh, those are the two things that I do in what I would call part one. Uh, to be sure that we understand what the relationship is. Um, uh, and that's uh, very important. Then part two, and then we're done. Part two is, here are some tools that help you have a strong partnership. And um, if it's okay, I'll give you examples of what some of these five tools would be. Would that be okay? That'd be great. Sure. Okay, all right. So the first thing, um, I grab their attention because they're expecting me to you know, talk about the people skills. First thing I do is I say, forget people set up your area for success. So tool number one is set up for success. And what I mean by that is um, uh, when I was a specialist and when I was a group counselor, what would usually happen is we would finish, uh, let's say a period B, you know, which was from 9.30 to 10.10 or something like that. And other groups would start showing up. Those kids would walk in while we were finishing with the first group. There was chaos, there was no time to clean up, there's no time for Aaron and me to talk to each other about so what worked and what didn't because we're the instructors. There's no time for me to uh, uh, catch my breath. There's no time to get water. It's just nonstop because one group bleeds uh, into another. So what I came up with was to have a get ready zone, a get ready zone. And this has been one of the things that people have told me have really uh, been fundamental in, in changing the relationship. And it also sets up something that is even more important that we're gonna do in a moment. But this is very simple. My get ready zone is literally uh, an area that is a short distance from where you're gonna do the activity. And that's where um, Sam brings her girls before they come to your activity area. So uh, uh, let me be very specific, as you know, I love to be. At Arts and Crafts, you put another picnic table and it's uh, 20 yards away from the crafts area. And that's where you bring your kids. And when Aaron is ready for you at crafts, Aaron walks over and uh, escorts you to the crafts area. This tiny change 
allows you to catch your breath, clean up, have conversations with your co-leaders, do a quick one minute assessment about what worked and what didn't, et cetera. Now, if you are really tingling with the opportunity to meet a really big challenge, I'll give you one. In addition to this just being uh, a safety cone or a special tree with a sign on it, uh, I urge you to use the get ready zone as a place where you mentally and or physically get the kids ready for your activity. So for example, suppose you were teaching a sport, wouldn't it be awesome if you had uh, a, a tree or something else there that you tied a photograph of famous athletes in that particular sport? or you put a card up with a question that we're gonna answer, or you showed uh, pictures of different kinds of art and asked people, which of these do you like and why do you like them? So in other words, there's some substantive, excuse me, um, a thing to do for 60 or 90 seconds while we're waiting. We're not just standing there in the heat wishing that the activity started for us. You can have a puzzle, you can have a question, you can have a famous quote uh, from Billie Jean King, one of the world's greatest tennis players, whether your activity is tennis or just any other sport. It's actually fun to come up with what these things are. And this is the get ready zone at the highest possible level. It gives the counselor something to stimulate conversation with the kids. You can have a warm up, um, uh, a physical activity that you can do. Uh, if you've uh, read my uh, second Training Terrific Staff book, you know I have a chapter in there about a game that I call um, Simon Says Please. The only difference in this game from the Simon Says is that you don't do it unless Simon says please. I also <laughs> call this Simone Says Please. Well, this is one of my favorite warm-up games. And um, you can simply put the instruction to that in one sentence. Somebody could walk up to that never having even seen my game and be able to lead this game. And when you say Simon uh, says please jump up and down five times, you know, jumping jacks is what we call it. Um, uh, the kids are physically warmed up and they're, they get their excitement out. They're you know, less ready to jump over the picnic tables. So in other words, in summary, this get ready zone is a really terrific uh, thing to do. And it sets you up for what we'll do for tool number three. But in great suspense, let me first tell you what my tool number two is and then we'll get to three. But the walk from your get ready zone to uh, the actual activity area um, will allow you to implement what we're gonna do in step two. And in step two or part two, um, what you do is in your own head as the activity specialist. What I ask them to do is to come up with two things. And the two things I ask them to come up with um, a rhyme to make it easier. It's a goal and a partner role. And I write that on the flip chart. You want a goal and a partner role a goal and a partner role. And I have them say that with me because that really is gonna be a mantra they're gonna be thinking of every time they teach one of these activities. A goal and a partner role. Now the goal is, what's the instructional goal? It's in two parts, I'm sorry. The goal is, what's your instructional goal? So for example, um, at our instructional goal at the sport activity is to teach kids uh, to uh, bend their knees and uh, lower body flexibility. Uh, bend their knees um, and positions of their feet, et cetera, in a sport. And that's really what we're working on in the sport today. Um, uh, in crafts, it might be um, uh, how to uh, express yourself individually using the same materials that other people have. And creativity is looking at new ways to do old, old things, et cetera, whatever the instructional goal is. The other part of the goal is how does doing this activity support the mission? which those of you who have followed my work know uh, is, um, uh, is, is my reason for living. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I call that, uh, uh, the term I coined for this is the intention, where this activity is something that supports our mission, which is to build great people. This, of course, is a higher level uh, kind of thing. Um, again, if you're familiar, uh, uh, my Growing Great Qualities and Kids book explains this as level one and level two. Level one are the activity or physical skills that you're going to learn, like keeping your eye on the ball or moistening the end of a paintbrush to make it a thin line instead of a wide line. Those are things that only help in the activity. Level two are how does this make you a better person? Uh, patience, respect, responsibility, teamwork, etc. Um, that's something for a whole podcast or series of them. Um, uh, and it's the book I'm, it's book number seven I'm writing right now. You know? <laughs> 
So if I look a little with bags under the eyes, that's it's <laughs> number seven. Not um, at all. Uh, and then, so that's the goal. So in other words, what what is your specific goal for this activity? And then the second thing is role, the partner role. What do you want the people who are coming with their kids to do? And what integral role will they have in the teaching of this particular lesson? There's a key magic word that you have to use when coming up with the role for me, the group counselor who's bringing my kids, and that word is meaningful. Because if what I'm doing is not meaningful and therefore challenging and interesting and important, I'm just not gonna do it. Um, another way to say that is to flip it around. If this is busy work, forget it. You know, if it's just taking kids to the bathroom and dealing with, uh, uh, with Caitlin, who you know, uh, always wants everything right away and has no patience and throws tantrums, um, uh, if just dealing with those behaviors, uh, I, I don't want to do that. I've been doing that the last two hours. Uh, I want something that's more interesting to do and more challenging and something that will help me grow. So um, those are the two things you have to have. Now, by the way, the subversive reason I do this is because now I'm really giving them instructional training. It, it, this, this is a great way to build up collaboration, but it's a great way for them to be better instructors. So if you took all the collaborators away now, and all you did was have them uh, have a goal uh, that's two parts. What's the actual activity goal, level one? And what's the level two? How do we make a better person using this activity? That makes this a better part of the day camp mission. Um, uh, and then step three. Um, step three is you have to communicate this stuff. So to review, you set up, you set yourself up for success. That's that get ready zone. Um, you decide what you want to accomplish. Uh, this is like your lesson plan, but uh, we've been more detailed about what lesson plan means at a camp. And now the third thing you do is you have to communicate that to uh, Andy when Andy's bringing his boys over to your area. Now, because I've set up this get ready zone, this is the way this plays out. What you do is you walk up to the zone and the first person you look at is Andy. You don't look at the kids. The first person you look at with direct eye contact is the counselor is the group counselor because you don't want that person to feel sidelined. So the way I do it is I go up and I say, Andy, great to see you. You bought the best boys at camp. You bought your great group, but it's in that order. And then I put my hand out and I shake Andy's hand. So there was a direct communication with Andy, with his two assistant counselors, his counselors in training. I say hello to them, how's your day going? And then I open my eyes, uh, my arms really wide and I embrace the entire group and say, it's so great to see all of you. Because from the very beginning of every single period, I want the staff to know you are not invisible. I see you, you are very important, you're my partners. I'm gonna greet you first. I think that that's really important. Um, uh, and then what you do is you say, where do you see what we're going to do? This is so exciting. And as you walk the 10, 12, 15, 20 steps to the actual activity area, what you do is you communicate the goal and the role. What you do is you say, and can I, can I I'll give you an example right now? What you do is you say, um, uh, Aaron, at gymnastics today, we're really working on some fine details. In the forward roles, we're getting their shoulders into the role and not their head. Some fine tuning stuff about their balance when they get out. Mainly, we're gonna be working on rolling and getting their heads out of the picture. We're gonna work a lot on shoulder rolls and that kind of detail, and the details make success. And then what you do is you explain the role. You take another five steps and you say, so I'm gonna send two or three kids over to you uh, at a time after we all go over this. And I want you to coach them being sure that they're rolling on their shoulders, not on their head. Um, uh, I'll give you another example. Sam, as we walk over to art, our really big life skill today is gonna be patience because this takes a lot of patience. So you and I are gonna be really concentrating on saying what patient people say. Um, uh, and we, I've actually put it up on a piece of paper right there so kids can see it because we want them to learn what patient people say. So we're going to be we're going to be walking around the table constantly saying, take your time. There's no rush. Go slow. Doesn't have to be perfect. Those are the four things that patient people say. So this should not take more than 20 or 30 seconds. And what you've done is um, made them feel very important. You've let them know why we're teaching today, what the actual objective is. And um, you've uh, let them know that um, they're gonna be playing an important part. And uh, if you can and wanna make this more advanced, 
you can give them a choice. Would you like to work with the kids in small group? Would you like to work with the larger group? You know, because choices make people feel powerful too. And so then when they walk over, uh, then you've got the opportunity to uh, work with them in a meaningful way. And with those three steps, I have two more extra, but I'm going to stop and let you jump in there. There's two more coming though. All right. Well, that's great. I just, you know, I think the, um, the goal and role thing is just perfect. It really is perfection. Um, that's the kind of thing, it, you know, short and sweet. That, that's what these people need. And it, and it is communication. Like you said, yeah. it's, it's all about communication. And I, and I love what you said about the uh, activity leader greeting the staff person first. Because like you said, there's a human element. People work at camp because they love cute kids, right? And so here comes these cute kids. And then all of a sudden, the activity leader is taken by the kids and dealing with that. And now the, they've already created a separation, Right. And now the, the, the activity leader looks at his watch and says, oh, my goodness, we got we got to start. OK, everybody. Blah, blah, blah. And now the the um, the counselors are completely out of it. Right. It's so easy to fall into that trap. Absolutely. Yeah. And our staff yeah. nowadays being Aaron's generation. Right. Like to know <laughs> the why. You know, why are we doing this activity? Oh, heck yeah. And and uh, just, uh, you know, just uh, as. Um, Somebody who can attest to um, learning from Michael and uh, and reading. Uh, I mean, I guess from from reading reading your books and hearing you speak. Uh, as a young staff member, when I first started, I actually uh, was a specialist, a canoe uh, a canoe staff member, and uh, we implemented the waiting area when I first learned about it, and it was a game changer for us. Like it just made the you know made the made every every bit of difference and it was an amazing thing. And just having uh I mean I'm a guy of who likes structure and organization so that helps uh for me. But uh um, it was a fantastic idea and uh everyone should try it. That's awesome. Keep rolling Mike. You're 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 doing great. Okay, well thanks. Um uh here's a couple tips. One of the most common complaints I get is uh well the staff clump together Clump is a big day camper and they talk oh, yeah. to each other and, you know, I have to go up to them and say, could you help so-and-so? Um, uh, don't do that. There's absolutely no reason to do that. I uh, made up a technique uh, 30 years ago I call assertive positioning, assertive positioning. And what it is, is as you walk up to the area, you tell them exactly where to stand or sit. And the way you do it is um, you walk in, let's say it's drama and we're in a circle. What you do is you come, everyone gather around, please. We always say please, uh, uh, and stand, you know, uh, just like this, and you model it with your hands to your side so that they see that they shouldn't be right on top of each other. And then in your next breath, you say, and Andy, would you please stand opposite me in the circle right there? I tell them exactly where to go. And so there's no possibility ever for them to sit on the picnic table and watch me talk to their kids. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, at the picnic table for crafts, as an example, Aaron, would you please sit in the, and I like to use this phrase, the guest of honor, you sit right over here. And I don't have them sit next to me. I may have them sit opposite me um, sometimes because talking to them across the children, is something that engages the children's attention. So assertive positioning is um, a way of being very proactive. They really don't have the opportunity to sit where they want or to wander around in the back. If, you know, at some camps, uh, two or three group leaders will bring their kids all at one time and uh, there'll be multiple art teachers, for example. So what you do is you say, could we please have, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Renee, okay, Renee, would you stand right over here next to me? And Steve, would you please stand here? And Tanisha, would you stand over here? I tell them where to stand in a warm, welcoming way. It's not bossy, because remember, I've said to them that they're gonna have an integral role and I know precisely what that's gonna look like. So they feel like they're a part of a, of a, of a teaching show that's about to begin and assertive positioning works uh, really, really well. And I need to quote Michael Brandwine to Michael Brandwine. Uh -oh. Because Michael- <laughs> I deny it. Specific is terrific. Yes. And, well, and for whatever reason, people don't, they don't get specific in camp, right? The tendency is to stay in this gray area, this nebulous zone, right? Where things are sort of, well, I meant and I thought and I, you know, that kind of thing. And then nothing gets accomplished. Like the more intentional you can be and the more concrete and the more specific, the more people appreciate it. Now you know your expectations, right? 
yeah. like it, we, we must say, I mean, I speak for Brandy who works for me. Um, you know, we, we just use that, that phrase constantly because it's just so wonderful, appropriate. Great. So let me just do one more secret. There's dozens, but um, I think we've got time for one more. And that is um, you can guide the group counselors who are your partners in this activity instruction and this uh, use of the activity to accomplish the mission. You can guide them while you're talking to the kids at the same time. The, the number one objection uh, that they give is, uh, well, you know, they don't want to help. Well, we don't give them a meaningful thing to do. And we, you know, sort of give it to them five minutes after they get there. That's one of the reasons they're distracted and, and think that this is time off to check each other out and to just, you know, wish they had a cell phone. Um, the other problem is that um, uh, we, um, uh, we, we haven't given them specifically, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let, let me say that again. We, we don't give them the, the kind of instructions they need to be good teaching partners. And the objection always is, well, there isn't time to do that. It's not like I can have a meeting with the counselors. You don't need a meeting with the counselors. So for example, uh, uh, let me think of a quick example. So suppose you're teaching kids to hit a baseball off of a uh, off of a safety cone. It's a, uh, uh, what, what am I missing? Oh, T-ball. Right, right. Yeah, T. Okay. So um, uh, let's say it's T-ball. So what you do is you say, Jeff, the counselor, Jeff, would you please stand over here? Here's what's going to happen. Now, remember, you told Jeff that what we're working on is eye and the ball, okay? Or you, you know what? I'm going to change my example. We're teaching the kids to throw and uh, let me do this whole thing together. I think this would be less confusing. I walk over to Jeff, I shake his hand, I look him in the eye, I welcome Jeff guys. Thanks, you're, I'm so glad you're here. I've got a great secret that will make you the greatest thrower uh, of anybody. Come on over, I wanna show you. As they walk over, I say, Jeff, we're working on following through in a throw. Most people don't tell kids that if you throw your arm in the direction of the ball, the ball will go where your arm ends up. I'm gonna explain that to everybody. You don't need to know this, but I'm gonna have you work with them on this and we'll do that together. Uh, and that'll teach them the importance of details in studying whether or not they're on track or not, which is a great skill for life. So that's my little speech that I memorized and that's my two goals, how it will affect them in life, which is self-evaluating your performance and how to throw up a baseball or a football or a Frisbee, any, any object. So now we're there and uh, the kids are all seated on the ground with us. And I asked Jeff to please sit over here. And I told him exactly where to sit. So he's not standing watching this. He's sitting on the ground with us. So now what I say is uh, 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 girls and boys, what we're going to do in a moment, not yet, is we're going to learn the secret to throwing a ball and getting it to go exactly where you want it to. And then what you do is you demonstrate that when you're throwing, you freeze your hand as you release the ball and look to see where your hand is pointing. And if your finger of your hand, your forefinger is pointing at the target that you were aiming for, then the Frisbee or the football or the ball is gonna go where you're throwing it. What a lot of kids do, including adults, is they throw, but they don't follow through. And so when they release the ball, their arm is really not pointing at what they're looking at. And that's the reason that they're not throwing accurately. So that's the sports skill that we're working on here. And then what you do is you say, so here's what's gonna happen. Jeff, would you stand up now, please? And um, uh, Tanisha, would you come over here and stand here? Now we're gonna have you throw the ball to Jeff. But when you throw the ball to Jeff, when you release the ball, he's going to yell, freeze, please. Would everyone say that? And everyone shouts, freeze, please. And when you do, you freeze like a, a, a statue. And Jeff is going to show you where you're pointing and see whether you're pointing at the target. So see, what you've done here is you've given Jeff a specific job. At the same time, you've told the kids what we're doing and why we're doing it. And Jeff knows exactly what he's supposed to do. And he rehearses it with you. And then you say, now let's divide the group up into two. And Jeff, you do the freeze please with the uh, uh, boys and girls over there. And I'm uh, gonna do the freeze please with them over here. And uh, we'll do this for about five, six minutes. And then we'll go on to skill number two. So this way you can actually teach them uh, what you want them to do and what you want them to be looking for and what you want them to be saying while you're talking to the kids. It's absolutely okay and in fact recommended to tell the kids what the instructor is going to be talking to them about. And in this way, you um, uh, have everyone on board with what you're trying to accomplish and you don't need extra preparatory time. I do it while the kids are actually standing there.
So to give one more fast example, if you're in the pool um, and you have a co-instructor, what you do is you say, co-instructor, if you would stand there, I'm going to ask everybody to uh, grab their paddle boards, uh, um, their kick boards, and they're going to kick. And what you're going to do is you're going to count. You're going to go one, two, one, two, one, two, and that'll give them the rhythm of how to move their feet. So you're telling them exactly what to do, exactly what to say. And they're going to do that um, because uh, you're going to give them praise and say, that's exactly right. There's one more variation of this that is highly effective, and I save the best for last. What you do is you say to the campers, I want you to show Andy how you swing the baseball bat. Do you do it like this or do you do it like this? And then I want you to run to Andy and explain to him why. So if I were teaching them to hold the bat off of their shoulder, I would say, would you show Andy where we hold the a bat? Everyone take your invisible baseball bat. You don't want all the kids with bats, believe me. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> then you say, show us, is it like this or is it like this? Okay, now can somebody, and here's the trick. Can somebody raise your hand, please, and tell your counselor, Andy, why we want it off? See, I direct the kids to talk to the counselor so the counselor can't ignore the kids. The counselor can't be talking to Aaron. They can't be chatting it up with, with Sam because I'm having the kids answer the questions, not to me, the instructor, but to their counselor. So the counselor is engaged from the very moment in a meaningful and productive way. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful ideas, wonderful techniques. Um, I just, you know, I know that the typical, let's say, 35-year-old teacher that's in this situation has spent, you know, 10,000 hours in the classroom not doing this, right? So it's something that has to be taught, and it's something that has to be coached, and it's something that has to be encouraged, and it's something that when you're walking around your camp and you're seeing the start of these activities, that you're, you know, you're seeing that this thing is actually, this, this kind of stuff is actually taking place and you're, you're, you know, you're giving them positive reinforcement when it is and you're coaching them when it's not because it's certainly a lot easier for them not to do it. It's a lot easier at the forefront. It ends up being a lot harder <laughs> later on in the period, right? When they haven't utilized and they haven't given assignments, you know, to these folks. Um, I, I think it's so great. And, and, um, I, I love the fact that, um, that we're framing this in a typical Michael Brandwine kind of way, which is honestly how I have framed my camp, in that the whole camp is a teaching experience, right? And, 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 it, and this starts at the interview of these activity leaders. Like when you first meet them and you're talking about their job, your job is not just teaching the campers. It is also teaching the counselors how to work with you and making them better people, right? I have a teen leadership program. We talk about that very intentionally, that the teen leaders are gonna be there and they're gonna have coaching cards and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's the same thing with the counselors. The counselors cannot be an afterthought. It, I, I just, I love Michael's example of the specialist shaking hands with the counselor as he approaches. Like that kind of intentionality has to be pervasive and has to be everywhere and has to be drenched in the materials they're going to read. And, and when you first meet them and all that kind of stuff, it can't just be, oh, and by the way, treat the counselors like they're your partners, right? That's not going to work. That word intentionality was what was going through my head the whole time. You know, the things Michael was, was, was saying aren't that difficult. It's just having the mindset that you're going to intentionally use the right language, yeah, you know, yeah. um, once you know what it is. Well, it's but discipline. Yeah. It's discipline. You know, and a lot of Michael's stuff. And, and, you know, Michael is great at giving us tools, right? But all of these tools take discipline. And they all take people checking up on it and making sure that it actually happens, right? You know, a 10 page fill in the blank Michael Brandwine workshop thing is only really good, right? If we follow, if you follow up on it and make sure these kind of things happen. And follow up includes the way you uh, give feedback mm -hmm. to the instructors. If all you do is talk about whether the kids are having a great time in learning and you don't even mention um, whether or not the staff as partners are learning and growing. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if you ask them, for example, so what's your goal for your partners, for the group leaders uh, this coming week, that says, I'm paying attention to this. This is a part of the way we evaluate uh, your, your uh, participation. In right. Right. When you sit down with them week three or whatever for their evaluations for your activity leaders, one of the questions needs to be, you know, are you providing goals and roles at the beginning of every period? 
You right. know, are we seeing that? Is okay. it actually happening? Can you give me an example of that? And what will you be teaching next week? And um, uh, can you, uh, you know, talk to me about what that would be? If I were the counselor, what would you say to me as I come from the get ready zone? And then if they say the get ready what, then you know what you need to do a week for because they haven't been paying attention. Yeah, mid-season, mid-season teaching. It's wonderful. Um, any other thoughts, friends, crew? Oh, Michael, that was, that was spectacular. Um, Thank you. So, so, so before we, uh, we go to the, the day camp tip of the week, um, I just want to give a plug to uh, one of our lovely sponsors, AM Skyer Insurance. The, um, for almost 100 years, the leading insurance broker for most of the best camps in America, strategic partner with summer camps ready to support any needs arising in PR, legal, health, facility, and more. Um, experience the AM Skyer difference. That's A M S K I E R dot com. Um, I don't know about you guys, uh, Sam and Aaron, but it was a crazy stormy season at Liberty Lake this year. Uh, we had some very scary, like, holy mackerel, I can't believe the wind is this rough. It's going to blow away my tents kind of experiences. Um, and we lost a lot of stuff. Um, as a result, and uh, AM Skyer came to the rescue. Um, it's really great uh, to have partners like them. And, and they have a group of people they call their camp partners. They're actually, a lot of them are retired camp legends that they enlist to uh, come to camps and do orientation training for child abuse and various other things. Plus they have psychologists and social workers and medical staff and legal team and child abuse experts. And not to mention the wonderfully uh, dedicated staff in their office that process my workman comms claims and all that. Um, but anyway, AM Skyer, um, thank you for sponsoring the Day Camp Pod and continuing uh, to help us get the word out. Um, all right, so Day Camp Tip of the Week. I'm going to start it off with, um, we, I mentioned the coaching cards um, with, that I got from Michael's book. Um, so so the, the, these cards we utilize for our team leaders that come to the activity, sort of like intern periods. They're going in and supporting these specialists, and we make it really easy for these specialists. And, and Michael, you know, I forgot the language that you use on these cards because we've morphed it into our own now. But I will tell you that what we have we use now, it's, it's sort of a brand wineism in that it, it rhymes. We use glow and grow, right? So one side of the card is where are they glowing? And then the other side of the card is where do they need to be growing? Right, so we get positive, and then we talk about some uh, some constructive critique there. And then um, these these specialists hand in the cards at the end of every week into a box that goes to our uh, our team leaders. And then the team leaders on Friday sit down with them and go through those coaching cards with each of the kids and talk about them with them, and uh, and try to make it really concrete and give them some specific feedback. So glow and grow. But Michael, what do you call them in your book? I remember it was something similar. Uh, I can't uh, remember. <laughs> now you're challenging me. All right. Uh, I think we, I think we call them Andy's cards or something. Uh, well, they were. It was uh, similarly uh, like positive. Try. I'm just kidding. I, I like to look at uh, what's working. Yeah. Needs to try. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what's working is a celebration of uh, uh, what we've done since our last conversation, and uh, I, I call it W squared. It's two W's, and NT three is new, and then three right. things to try what's working and new things to try. I like glow because then if you have a resident camp, you can do these feedback sessions in the evening. Mm, yeah, that's, it came from a resident camp. That's where I grabbed it from. I'm sorry, um, that joke but, obviously did not, did, that, that joke didn't land. I was talking about glowing and being able to see in the dark, but uh, <laughs> I just, just, just cut that out. Oh, come on. So, um, but, but yeah, I think the specialists really do enjoy being part of that growth process when framed the right way, you know, when they are prepared, when they know that they're part of that process of not just teaching, you know, eight year olds how to hold baseball bats, you know, but teaching these teens and young staff how to be better, you know, at, at their job and better humans and all they really embrace it. Absolutely. All right, Sam, you're up. All right. So, um, I had a conversation this week about trying to get kids involved in the activities and meeting them where they are. So the example um, I came up with um, was a version of marble painting. So with marble painting, you take the lid of a box so it has a lip, you put a piece of paper in there, a couple squirts of paint, and they roll their box around with the marble to make their painting. Well, if you've got a bunch of kids that are totally into toy trucks, let them use their trucks in the paint. So again, you've got their framework for each child. 
you put in the paper, you put in the paint, and they can drive their trucks all over the paper and make their picture that way. That's so fun, Sam. Sam, you got to make a Google Doc <laughs> of all these things and, and, and publish a book because you have so many of these kind of things. They're just unbelievable. And, and, and they're so easy and obvious, and they're just like, you know, wonderful. They're really great. Low budget, too. And yeah. uh, yeah. I, I would buy that book, Sam, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, what well, my idea actually is uh, something, Michael, you might have seen this uh, when you visited Robin Hood years ago, but uh, um, this was something that we implemented to help give, uh, you know, give the kids some, some, uh, uh, some choice when they were, it's actually in, in, in uh, conjunction with the, the uh, waiting area that, uh, that we were talking about. But we, we created these uh, specialty activity boards and, um, and they, were, they were colorful, uh, well, they are, I should say they are, I'm talking the past tense, but they, they're colorful um, um, boards with lots of different, uh, like sort of uh, visual symbols that uh, indicate the different activities that we're doing um, at each specialty area. So it holds the staff accountable, um, the, the specialty staff accountable to, to stick with our you know, program plan for the week. Um, it, it holds the counselors uh, uh, um, accountable and gives them, you know, the, in, in talking about that role that the counselors need a specific, sorry, in talking about that idea that the counselors need a specific uh, role to feel like they can, uh, you know, contribute, uh, we would list, you know, a very, very simplistic uh, um, thing that the counselor can do to get involved if they don't know how to get involved in the activity. Um, and then uh, some different choices that the kids can make um, to get involved in the activity in, in different ways. So, you know, if they're comfortable, um, you know, canoe was, was my was my area so if they're comfortable you know being a, a person in you know paddling then that's great if they're more comfortable being the person who's picking up the items on the scavenger hunt than they were you know they were a, a scavenger or whatever that whatever the title we used for it was so uh, those boards having them at each specialty area and uh, you can do them in many you know different ways we had actual metal poles with uh, bulletin boards but you can make them you know more simple or uh, uh, you know or, or more elaborate I'm sure in some places too so that was awesome. That's it. Mr. Brownwine, you got anything? Yeah, my tip, uh, my tip of the week is do anything that Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I, Sam, I want to see putting paint underneath uh, bus wheels in your <laughs> parking lot as, a, uh, as an arts and crafts area. <laughs> it started off with tip. See, that, that's a typical brand wine thing. Just make yeah. it bigger and over the top. Now, that would not be budget conscious, though, Michael. Not to yeah. Sam Thompson train is budget consciousness. I don't know. Well, I don't know. Let the kids drive the buses around. I think it'd be better. <laughs> how, how much drive? I mean, it's a closed area. It's right. I, you know, all right. I would like to apologize to the AM Skyer uh, people for suggesting that children. <laughs> <laughs> We, we love you guys, and I apologize for that suggestion. It was only a joke. Thank you, Michael Michael Brandwine, for being with us today. We appreciate to be with you, folks. Again, we appreciate it so much, and thank you to our Go Camp Pro executive producer Travis Allison and producer Matt Hansberger, and to our awesome sponsors ACA New York, New Jersey, Commercial Recreation Specialists, and AM Sky for allowing us to bring this podcast to you. And if you don't want to miss an episode of the Day Camp Pod, then you should subscribe on iTunes or wherever else you get your favorite podcasts. Check out the show notes from this and other episodes at daycamppodcast.com. And feel free to send us feedback and new ideas for future podcasts to our email address, daycampquestions at gocamp.pro. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of the Day Camp Pod. Thanks for listening. And thanks for making yourself a better day camp professional, improving your day camp for your campers and your staff. This has been the Day Camp Pod.